a little to the left. I feel like every time that you ask me to go to the left, there's a piece of tape there's falling. Like a falling. Wait, hold on one second. Hi, Beck, just following up on my last email. I'm sorry, stupid salesperson. Talk to camera two. Talk to camera two. I hope that wasn't on record. Talk to camera two. Okay, so do you want me to put my shoulders? Oh, hold on. Hi, Beck. Just wanted to circle back my proposal to see if you signed it. I'm sorry, another salesperson, two in a row. Last instruction. Camera two. Use your next words with me wisely. Thank you. <laughs> what, what is the last, camera two. Camera two, wait, hold on. Hi Beck, just wanted to bubble this to the top of your inbox. Happy Monday, I hope you and your family are well. Follow-ups, how to not F up your F ups. Let's go ahead and jump into the content. But first, let's start off with a little bit of an agenda. As far as an agenda for today's session, I wanted to break it down into six different pieces. Number one, I, of course, typical Beck Holland wanted to add a little bit of structure, a little bit of structure in terms of the kind of sequences you'll be running, and then um, a little bit of buildup going into the first email. Section two will cover the first email. Section three, the second email, which is follow-up email number one, and so on and so forth through four, five, and six, which are email three, four, and five, follow-up two, three, and four. Got it? Let's go. <laughs> Section one is a little bit of structure. So in terms of the structure of the sequences that you're going to be uh, running, I have two different buckets of sequences. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. If you want to know more about this, then you can go into um, the how to build a sequence with personalization sec uh, um, excuse me, session. But there are two basic buckets of, of scenarios or sequences that I'm building within my playbook for any team that I have. This is a comprehensive list of all the sequences that I'm running. So basically on the left, you're going to have uh, for bucket number one, all of the scenarios or sequences that you would build where you're basically mentioning the premise of the sequence to the prospect. And then bucket number two is going to be a bucket filled with all the different sequences that you can build where you wouldn't mention the uh, scenario to the prospect. So great example of why you wouldn't mention one, for instance, you'll have over here um, you know, number two, which is firmographic trigger off of crunch base for uh, companies who have just raised funding. So I've seen a lot of reps reach out and say like, hi, Scott, reason for my outreach is I noticed that you guys over at outreach just raised $50 million from Salesforce Ventures. Do you want to buy my stuff? Because I sell stuff for money, and you just raised some money. And it just comes off a little bit disingenuous to your prospects. So basically, um, all of these scenarios over on uh, in bucket two, you wouldn't mention. Whereas bucket one, you would. Um, but uh, bucket one is primarily filled with what I would call postbound premises and postbound sequences. So what is postbound really quickly? Inbound is going to be true demo request and chat box through either Drift or Intercom. Outbound is going to be a cold, um, you know, outbound scenario for anyone who has never heard of you. And postbound is going to be all of the in, or all of the premises in between. So a great example of that is content downloads, event attendees, webinar registrants, etc. You know, but basically all the leads for marketing that aren't a true inbound, like a demo request and a hand raiser, but they still know who your company is. So they have you know spiked buyer intent and they know exactly who you are. So these are all the different sequences that I am building into um, into my playbook whenever I have a team. Um, and you can read through some of them, some that are interesting, high value MQL or demoed in the past or, you know, common VCs uh, with me, you know, as a company and then common VCs with my customers. Maybe you have a customer who has common VCs with someone you're trying to prospect into. But this is an exhaustive deck and I have a sequence built for each one of them that looks the same in terms of structure, the same in terms of touch points, the same in terms of how many calls and emails that they have, another session for another time, another topic for another time. Um, but they all, uh, you know, have a little bit different messaging based on the personalized pr uh, premise to the prospect that I'm talking to. And then, of course, the postbound mention of whatever action they took for marketing um, that helped them get to know your company. In terms of the actual sequence, so I just gave you a little bit of an infrastructure, but essentially every sequence that I have um, with any team that I'm running looks, again, the same in terms of structure and touch points and number of emails, etc. So Every single sequence that I have is going to be 16 steps over 21 business days. And I follow um, the theory of actually MJ Hoffman, the author of Why You, Why You Now, talked a lot about his research on when you should reach out to people and how aggressive you should be with in terms of the sequences. 
And his theory was that you should be lighter in the front end and more aggressive in the back end of the sequence, whereas reps are normally flipped. Typically sales reps will be super aggressive in terms of when they email people and how often they email people and how often they call people in the beginning of a sequence. And then they peter off near the end, teaching your prospect that you're a little overbearing in the beginning off first impression. And that if they just wait long enough that you'll go away. So he suggested that you flip it. And I've seen a lot of success with that of basically in the beginning of your sequence, um, you know, that you'll notice over here in the beginning of your sequence that you want to be a little bit lighter. You want to get to know them and be heavily personalized and all the things that you're doing. And near the end of your sequence, you basically want to speed up uh, the amount of outreach. So I want to break down this structure a little bit. There are five different pods of outreach that I'm doing uh, within every sequence. So the first step of every sequence here is going to be that I will have my reps go to LinkedIn and research the prospect finitely and tease out three personalized premises that they're going to use to fuel the rest of the sequence. There are three personalized emails in the sequence. It's going to be cold email number one on day one, cold email uh, number three on day uh, 13, and then cold email number four on day, um, day 18. So basically, yeah, day 18, day 13, and uh, day one, and it's cold emails one, three, and four that have personalized premises. But there are five emails in every sequence, 10 cold calls in every sequence, and the five pods go like this. Your first pod is near the beginning, and it's gonna be a cold email. You know, you're gonna do your LinkedIn research and you're gonna have a cold email on day one, and then you're gonna have a cold call on that exact same day and a cold call the next day and leave a voicemail. So that's your first pod of outreach, essentially, is you're basically gonna email them the first day, you know, with a personalized premise. You're gonna uh, cold call them that day and then cold call them the next day. The second pod, there's gonna be a six day delta, if you'll notice, um, between pod one and pod two. So pod one ends on day two, and then pod two starts on day eight. So basically there's a six day delta, whereas day eight, you have a cold email, and we're gonna go into the text of these emails um, a little bit, you know, in just a little bit. But on um, day eight, you're gonna do cold call, or cold email number two, and a cold call on that, that exact same day, and a cold call on the following day. So that's pod two is day eight, eight, nine. Then you're going to you're going to launch into pod three, which is basically day uh, sorry day thirteen for cold email, and then day thirteen for cold call and for, uh, day fourteen for cold call. So the third pod starts on day thirteen. So there's a five day delta as opposed to a six, and basically you're going to do a cold email, cold call, cold call. So each one of these case scenarios, you're going to do cold email, cold call, cold call, and typically you're going to leave a voicemail within the last uh, the second cold call. So again, pod three is gonna be um, 13, uh, 13 and 14, and it's gonna be cold email, cold call, cold call. Then you're gonna get a little bit faster, and the fourth pod starts on day 18, where you're gonna go 18, 18, 19. Again, cold email, cold call, cold call. We'll go into the script a little bit later. And then your last pod is gonna be uh, start on day 19 with cold call, cold call, um, cold email. So basically you'll see here near the end that you're speeding up pretty dramatically when it comes to the amount of steps that you're doing and how many you're deploying on your prospect altogether because essentially you're gonna break up with them on day 21, but you want to be lighter uh, in the beginning, get to know them, do some LinkedIn research, pull three personalized premises and start to be cool in the you know, beginning of uh, your sequence when they're getting to know you. So they get to know you as the person who knows who they are, who's personalizing to them, which most reps aren't. And you're gonna be kind of lighter in your outreach in the beginning. And near the end of the sequence, you're basically gonna speed up to where in here in the meet, you're gonna go 18, 18, 19, 20, 21, 21, to where they finally get to the point where they're like, if I don't answer this person, they're not gonna go away. So I've heard a lot of reps say like, well, is this too aggressive? You know, what if I overwhelm my prospect? Again, this is just my experience, and I've done it with three teams now. Um, but with all three teams, uh, I'm sorry, four teams, with all four teams, essentially, when we are personalized, people weren't mad, even if we were aggressive in the uh, amount of outreach that we were doing, if we were personalized. Now, if you don't know who the person is, and you haven't done your research, and you don't know their business, that's where I've seen pros uh, prospects get really, really mad. So general rule of thumb, 
if you have done some research on someone and basically when they pick up the phone, you're able to you know, state three different facts about them and you really know about their background and their company, they typically won't get mad at you even if you are doing quite a bit of outreach. So that's the structure of the sequence. So again, just a little bit of review. Every sequence that I've listed in here, whether it's in uh, bucket one or bucket two, all 14 of them, they all have the exact same structure. It's just the difference between content download sequence, for instance, and webinar registrants is that at the beginning of that sequence, it will mention, you know, hi, Scott, I noticed that you, you know, attended the uh, follow-up email session, but more importantly, and then they transition to the personalization. But every single one of the steps for the sh like shell sequence, quote unquote, that incorporates personalization is the exact same for every single um, sequence. So let's get into the first email. The first email, and I go into this quite a bit in the cold email session if you wanna get uh, check that out um, more. But the first email, essentially, you're gonna do four lines. The first line is gonna be the longest line where you're gonna pick out a premise about the person in specific. So you're gonna say, you know, hi Scott, the reason for my outreach is I saw that you wrote this article on scaling teams effectively. One line that stood out to me was it all comes down to having great conversations. The second line is going to be your value prop, but hooked back into the personalization. You wanna be careful not to personalize and then it has nothing to do with your second line. So your value prop line is where you're effectively, you're breaking down for them why that piece of personalized information actually ties into something that you can do. I'm gonna go into that a little bit later in season two on how to hook personalization to relevance, but that's essentially the gist of this line where I'll give you an infrastructure, and this is the medium length line, where your whole goal is to take the personalized premise you know, that you did in line one and relate it down to line two about what you, uh, you do as a company. The third line is gonna be your CTA, or uh, what we'd affectionately call a call to action, where, which should be your shortest line, where you're asking for one time to unpack the above agenda in the email um, you know, for someone that's like them that's in their role. So what this can look like, I would always suggest striking up some kind of barter of like, if you give me the shot, if you give me an opportunity when, you know, to meet you on Wednesday at two and unpack a little bit of how VPs of sales you know, leverage outreach to drive more conversion, I promise that we can part ways as friends if you're not impressed. Or I promise that I won't hammer you with follow-up emails in your inbox if you don't find any value. So you basically wanna communicate to your prospect that if they give you that chance in that 30 minutes, you wanna give them the recognition and self-awareness that most people would jam their inbox with all this follow-up post-meeting. It's one of Prospect's biggest fears and that you will not be that rep if they give you the respect and courtesy of you know, giving you 30 minutes and a shot to pitch your product. And then the fourth line of the first email is gonna be the push-pull technique. So I go a little bit deeper in cold emails, but essentially a push-pull technique is a reprieve in the last line of your email where you're basically communicating to your buyer that either way, regardless of you know, whether they buy your product or not, or whether they give you the time, that basically, yeah, either way, I'm such a big fan of your team, be genuine, but either way, I'm such a big fan of your team, you know, excited to see what you do in 2021, and you know, uh, hope you're staying safe and sane with everything going on in the world. So this is a good place to communicate to your buyer that even if there's nothing in it for you in the positive stance, that you really, really like their work. So what that sounds like from the beginning, is, you know, hi, Scott, reason for my outreach is I saw that you wrote this article on scaling teams effectively. One thing that stood out to me was when you, um, one line that stood out to me was when you said, it all comes down to great conversations. What if you can ensure your reps over at outreach were having great conversations with your prospects, really hitting home with, in, with them in terms of what matters to them in their day and uh, booking more meetings as a result. If you give me a shot Wednesday at two to unpack how VPs of sales leverage, you know, chorus to um, understand and break down their calls and, and drive a little bit more conversion, I promise we can part ways as friends if, if you're not impressed. Either way, such a big fan of your team, keep the good articles coming, and I hope you're staying safe and sane with everything going on in the world. So that's a great example for email one. So now let's talk about the follow-up emails. So, th oh, this is the example. This is the shot within outreach. And again, you can look in the deck below. I hope that you've downloaded it for this. If not, then I'd pause the session here and go ahead and download it. 
but here's a little bit of the text that I was using in terms of I'm giving my reps quite a bit of structure. If you see within this example, I'm not just building an email and then leaving it blank. I'm essentially saying, if you notice here, I'll, I'll say reason for my outreach is I saw and leave it blank. One line that stood out to me is blank. And I even put in a little dynamic tag here with outreach that blocks me from sending this message unless this is filled in. So I wanted to be sure that all my reps were personalizing and that they didn't miss this. Um, I have had reps before in the past, before I was using outreach, basically send out an email that said, reason for my outreach as I saw, and then it just went dot, 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 and then signed their name. Actually, the prospect booked a meeting, but do not try that. <laughs> so there's quite a bit of structure in this email, but it's still, you'll see that it gives quite a bit of uh, room for personalization and creativity within, within the email. So it gives them some structure, speeds them up, but gives them some room to breathe. So now let's talk about the second email. So you've had email one that's personalized. You picked out the premise of the article. You know, you really drilled it home in the value prop and landed, stuck the landing in the CTA. So what does the second email look like? And what does emails three through five look like? The second email, which is follow-up email number one, is go I'm going to lean on what outreach would call the agoji sequence. What's an agoji sequence? An agoji sequence is basically when you respond to the first email literally with the words, any thoughts. Sounds crazy, sounds like a nuts idea, and I was crazy enough to try it. I said, okay, if you have the research there, then I'm gonna go ahead and deploy it. And it actually is a really good reminder for your prospects. So this is actually really can be an automated email that requires no personalization other than I always suggest checking a couple of grammar things like is the name right, da da da, just cause that's how I'm built. But basically the second email is just an agoji email. It's a reply email to the first email. You say any thoughts, and then I can stomach leaving it like that. So I basically on um, the uh, last below that, I would put PS and I would add some kind of value. I'm the kind of person that whenever someone emails me, I crave that they add value to the conversation. And so I can't expect a prospector to add value to me if I'm not adding value to anyone I prospect into, right? So I would suggest attaching some piece of content to that Agoji email of like, instead of just saying any thoughts, you say any thoughts, you know, all the best, Beck. And then it says, P.S., given your role over at Okta, I thought you might enjoy this piece of content on cold calling effectively. But basically, regardless of what email you're sending, I always suggest that you add some piece of value. So what that looks like with an outreach is this. You can kind of see uh, the majority of it and then I'll switch sides, but it says, you know, any thoughts, hi, first name, all the best. And then a great example, as I said, you know, PS, given your team's uh, growth here, I thought you might like this session that's, um, that covers how to structure a cold call to drop more meetings. The slide deck for the session is also attached. So basically, you know, this is really an automated email for your reps. Um, you know, that it gives them, they can basically send this out as is and they don't have to make any kind of corrections onto the email. Okay, email three. Email three is going to be follow-up email number two. So you had your first email that was personalized. You had your second email that was the Agoji email that you replied to the first email and added some content with the words, any thoughts. Email three is going to be a mirror of email one in terms of structure, but a few different words so they don't realize they're on the script. So email three essentially is the same setup as email one, where you have a personalized premise in, in um, you know, the first line. And again, this needs to be your second personalized premise. So don't reuse the first one. I would go for a second one here of like, you know, hey, Scott, reason for my outreach and just reach out cold. Don't make any reference to emails one or two. Meaning you don't wanna remind someone if it has no reason, purpose, or uh, strategy behind it, you don't want to remind someone that they broke up with you, right? You don't want to remind them that you didn't add value enough to get the first meeting. So you want to come in cold, pick up another personalized premise, and basically write the email based on that. So again, you have personalized premise. Then you're going to have your uh, body, which is your second line, medium length, that you map back to the personalized premise. You'll have a CTA where you request one time to impact the agenda, and then you do the push-pull. Um, if you struggle with this, I just on a side note, I think a lot of people struggle with the idea that they're bugging people. 
So I flipped kind of the table on my reps one day and I, they said, well, I just called this person, <clears throat> excuse me, and they didn't pick up. And I said, okay, let's call him Dennis. I said, okay, Dennis, let me ask you a question. Have you been cold called in the last 48 hours? And he said, yeah, I saw a number that I didn't know. I said, did you pick up? He said, no. I said, did they leave a voicemail? He said, no. I said, do you have any idea who that person was or what do they want? What they want? He goes, uh-uh. I'm like, same with your prospects, right? So their user journey is quite a bit different than what you your biggest fear is. So again, I would always be personalized, but if you struggle with that, I would think through the amount of cold calls that you have turned down and you know not taken the call and not thinking any thought anything um, about it. So um, again, it's the same in terms of structure, personalized premise, in line one, body that's hooked to the personalized premise. You're gonna have a CTA to request one time to unpack and then the push pull, but in a little different words. So here you can see the text. And again, you know, you have the deck in front of you, so you can see a little bit more. Um, but very, very similar structure. But instead of saying what if in line two, I said imagine you could. And then in line four, for instance, in the push pull, instead of saying either way, I said in any case. So you always want to make sure that your wording is changing up, but the technique is the same. So anyone who's any kind of high, you know, any kind of asset to an organization or any kind of figure skater or any kind of musician, it's like, it's all within this set of rules. It's all within, you know, whatever, the four bar blues, you know, but each song sounds a little bit different, right? So you want to make sure that you're staying within structure but you're also having a little creativity and changing up the words just enough to where they realize that they're not being, you know, on some kind of repeatable structure that you have. So again, email one's personalized. Email two is the reply email to email one. That's the Agoji email that you had content. Email three is personalized again without any reference. Email four. Now we're getting meaty. <laughs> email four is you are going to respond to email three and you are going to fall on your sword, so to speak, but really take accountability for why your prospect is not responding. Accountability is one of the most attractive characteristics, at least from my perspective, that you can have in life in general, but certainly in prospecting. And a characteristic that I don't see enough of, to be honest, in myself and in others around me. When someone reaches out to me and says, I'm sorry if you feel that way, or I'm sorry if you feel that I X, Y, and Z. It never feels like a real I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I did this thing, and I'm sorry if I feel this thing, or if you feel this way, are two very, very different statements. One has accountability, one doesn't at all. And when you think about how you're interacting with prospects, all you really have is the messaging in front of you, right? So I know it feels like we're being a little bit nitpicky probably here, you know, or I'm drilling in a little, bit, a little bit here, but how you talk to your prospects matters. Words matter with your prospects and in general. So when you're taking accountability and instead of saying like, hey, I emailed you five times and you haven't responded, in email four, you wanna to reply to email three and say, hey, I was reading an article the other day about how to be, you know, relevant to your uh, buyer or your prospects in terms of buyer persona. And I was convicted about the email that I sent to you, right? So you want to lead with the reason you're not responding is me, <laughs> which is the truth in most cases is that we haven't been rele relevant enough, right? In the second line, you want to take ownership and you want to ask for a second request or permission to pitch them again. So you want to say, I should have something like you get the, the technique more than the wording, but the wording is, um, you know, that I use typically is I should have respected your time and given your permission. I like another shot to earn a slot on your calendar, something like that, where you say, like, I should have done better. Um, and I like one more shot if it's OK with you. The third line, you want to go into your third personalized premise. So email one, you are personalized. Email three, you are personalized. And email four, in the second half, you are personalized. So it'd read, you know, again, from the top, um, you know, hi, Scott, uh, reason for my outreach is, I was re uh, reason for my outreach is I was reading an article the other day about being relevant to your buyer in terms of persona. And I was convicted about the message I sent to you. I should have respected you, your time a little bit more and given your permission, I'd like another shot to earn a slot on your calendar. I saw that you liked 
Josh Braun's post the other day about uh, selling based off of um, impact questions or illuminating questions over the uh, features that your product offers. Go into the body. What if you can ensure all of your reps over at Okta were asking great questions to your prospects, driving more pipeline in the meantime, and closing more closed one deals as a result? Go into the CTA, same kind of structures of personalization, emails in one and three. If you give me a shot, you know, Wednesday at three to meet you and unpack that idea that I have to drive more pipeline, I promise you won't hear from me again, you know, if you don't see the fit. So basically, this is the example email, but you get the, uh, the gist here. I basically am putting in this kind of uh, script as something that the reps don't have to mess with, like they just see it in there and they, they can make a couple tweaks if they want to based on style. I'm never opposed to that, but they get the basic infrastructure of their being accountable and they're asking for another shot. And then I basically put in a line here of like, here's where your custom pitch goes. And I put, again, the dynamic tag with an outreach so that they can't send this email as is physically, they can't send it until they put something in here and I remind them of the flavors that I want and the flavors that I don't want by putting the, uh, the phrase seven pillars and seven deadly sins so that they know they know, uh, know what to think about when they're writing the email. So that's email one through four, but what about breakup? Breaking up is hard to do, right? Especially when it's with someone who has never talked to you. In the breakup email, I wanna go back a slide. Breakup email, the point of a breakup email is to get your prospect to respond. It's not to associate blame. It's not to let them know that you're exiting the door. It's not to, you know, pin it on them that they haven't responded. It's not to tell them that you need to update your CRM with more information if they would just respond. All of that is great in theory but it makes them feel like the bad guy. So I've seen a number of breakup emails. One for instance is, you know, I've tried to email you seven times. Here's a list of things that could be going on with you. Either number one, you're not interested. Two, you are off on an island somewhere. Three, you don't value data. Four, you just want me to go away. Could you just give me the respect of responding so I can update my CRM? The joy of selling, and the pain of selling is that our prospects are really smart. <laughs> they know exactly what we're saying in the subtext of this text. So whenever you're saying that, everyone, especially if they're in sales or have had any experience with it, they know that most of our data, I I've never seen a company's data, a data that was 100% clean, that they said every single person in my CRM you know, is the actual right person, still at the company, the correct email, the correct, you know, phone number and has the entire user, user journey based on multi-touch attribution for every single touch point that they've had with my company. Your prospect knows that and they know that it would be called a yes trap if they were to respond to you. A yes trap is coined by Chris Voss, um, the uh, author of Never Split the Difference, an FBI negotiator. And he basically said that whenever you ask someone, hey, can I ask you a question? and you have like lotions in your hand at the kiosk at the mall, that your prospect says no, because they know that in saying yes to you asking a question, they just wasted 15 minutes of their time and potentially $150 to buy lotion that they don't need. They know that it's just a trick to get to uh, you to talk to them so that they can sell to you. So within a breakup email, you essentially, you wanna do it, but you wanna do it in a very accountable manner and a very, um, uh, value adding way almost and just giving a little context and walking out the door. So the first um, line of the breakup email is I would take accountability and follow my sword so to speak and say you know hi Scott reason for my outreach is I wanted to check in one last time and make sure that I haven't overstepped my bounds. You get the idea you can use it any kind of words that you want I just want to check in one last time and make sure I haven't messed something up make sure that I haven't hosed the relationship here, but you're essentially communicating to your prospect that you just want to, you know, poke your head and make sure that you didn't, didn't screw anything up here. Given your second line, you want to essentially put a body, but with research. Given your original article that you wrote, and I'd put in one of the personalized premises that you used within the first, um, you know, three personalized emails, but given the article that you wrote, I originally thought it made sense to reach out. 
then you want to walk out the door. Maybe it's just me, but I'm getting the feeling that now is just not the best time to connect. That's what a lot of your prospects are thinking. And whenever you call out what's in the room and what they're thinking, it helps build rapport with them because they think that you understand them, number one. And number two, you're not gonna push like every sleazy other sales rep that they've met. So maybe it's just me, but I'm getting the feeling that now is just not the best time to connect. And then be okay with it. Did I get that right? If not, no worries. Perhaps we can connect in the future. So you wanna push pull near the end by saying, even if that's correct, it's not a problem. Maybe we can connect down the line and then you wanna sign it. So this is one of the highest response templates I have ever um, like experienced in my career. You know, typically, I mean, conversion rates can um, fluctuate for cold outbound uh, for uh, template response, but I've seen them go anywhere from 0.02 response rates. Um, I think the highest that I've seen as a template was hovered around four to five percent response rates to a cold template. This one for me has boasted anywhere from 15 to 19 percent. It depends um, on the buyer person and the company that I was selling to, but it essentially gets your prospects to understand that basically you're walking out the door, that you're not blaming it on them, that you're not mad, you're giving a little context and making sure that you didn't screw up. And then the really fun kicker is if you look near the end, I always include always be adding value, right? So I say like, hey, P.S., I thought you might like the session below. So you're gonna have the character, not only are you gonna tell them that you're getting the feeling it's just not the time to connect, you want to make sure you didn't screw up here, you know, giving your thing why you thought it would uh, make time to connect, and that it's not a problem that it's not a good time for them to connect. You're not only gonna have that good a character, you're going to give them some piece of value even when you're breaking up with them right? So search after something. I always suggest third-party content because prospects tend to not trust your content if it's coming from you, especially if it's proving how awesome your tool is. Research their buyer persona, get to know them in the role and something that would really make their day better, and then attach a piece of content, you know, about that thing, and you'd be surprised to see the conversion rates on it. I think one of the most uh, best performing pieces of content that I've done recently is I had this entire pandemic sequence, right? Our buyer has changed, <clears throat> COVID changed a lot of the world, and I wanted to reinvent our, our buyer persona pitch according to people's new normal in the selling that they're doing. And I had four pieces of content in that entire sequence. One piece of content was literally just, I don't know if you like to work out at home, but here's a sheet on the top 10 exercises that you can do in your living room with no costs or additional equipment. That got a 65% uh, click rate, even when our response rate was nowhere near that, right? So you want to add value to people's day, regardless of whether that is advantageous for you and your platform, because then when they see you and they think of you, they think of the person that did stuff for them, even when there was nothing in it for me, and even when it wasn't necessarily my job, right? So that's it. Um, in summary, I know that Emails are a really, really tough game. I know that following up with our prospects is not always the most fun. We want them to just say yes right off the bat. But I think that we have a really fun opportunity to be really creative and say things to our prospects that even in email two, three, four, and five, they can be just as strong as email one. And that is predicated on knowing your buyer and thinking a little bit outside of the box. So that's it. That's all of the content, all 36 slides of it for this one session. If you like the session, be sure to go to flipthescript.co and sign in so you can see all of the different sales topics that are just like this one. And if you have a couple of minutes to spare, go to Flip the Script on LinkedIn and be sure to give us a follow. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Yeah.